this is the thing. This is what everybody's talking about now. Everybody's talking about, you know, how can I how can I thrive in this stressful world and how can I get a mental edge and how can I how can I feel good instead of feel blah. Friends, there's no shortcut or magic pill that'll make you feel mentally fit. It requires daily work across five mountains of integrated vertical development. But what if I told you there was real emerging science that validates thousands of years of Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine, which can help you feel better and propel you forward on your mental fitness journey by upgrading your gut brain access. This is game changing and this is life changing information. Welcome to the most exciting adventure of your life. Welcome to a new way of living and welcome to the five mountain adventures podcast. Hi, I'm Casey and I'm Andy. We help people feel better and thrive in stressful times. Our goal for 2023 is to help 5,000 people not only feel better, but to thrive in these stressful times via our podcast and mental fitness one-on-one -on -one and small group coaching. You can help us reach our goal by rating and sharing our podcast and following us on Instagram and YouTube. Help us raise the vibration of our world, moving from anger, fear, and division to courage, understanding, and compassion. It starts with us. And today, we are speaking with Dr. Sean Talbot. He's the author of hundreds of articles and more than a dozen books on nutrition and fitness. His work has been featured in media outlets around the world, including a variety of segments on The Dr. Oz Show, as well as at the White House as part of Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign to fight childhood obesity. Doc Talbot holds an MS in exercise science from University of Massachusetts and a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from Rutgers. He also holds advanced certificates in entrepreneurship and innovation from MIT. He's a fellow of both the American College of Sports Medicine and the American College of Nutrition, and currently serves as the Chief Science Officer at Amari, the mental wellness company. A veteran of dozens of Ironman triathlons and trail ultramarathons, Doc Talbot is intrigued by how our mental wellness impacts our physical well-being. He's fascinated by the links between diet, biochemistry, and psychology. The idea that what we eat changes the biochemistry of our bodies and influences how we think, feel, and behave. Welcome, Dr. Sean Talbot. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, you guys. Absolutely excited about this conversation. So important, uh, we feel. And we are curious, though, what you are most curious about in your life right now. Oh, I, well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm constantly curious and that's a that's a blessing and a curse i think you know it's um you know i i, I think i suffer uh, as much as anybody from the from the shiny new thing syndrome right where you're like you know oh that's really cool oh that's really cool and like the 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 kind of work that i do now right around nutritional psychology around the microbiome and the gut brain axis there couldn't be a better time to be a curious person right because the research is just coming out and one of my one of, one of the problems with that is that i have trouble keeping up right there's so many interesting things to read about and to act on and to try to implement into your own life and tell other people about you know that's that's the one thing you know it's just it's a lot right now <laughs> but that's you know the flip side of that is that there's a, there's a lot of tools that we can use that we can recommend to people that help them, you know, thrive in this stressful world, like you guys say all the time. Yeah, right. It's, um, gosh, what a what a great time to be alive, right? The Chinese curse, uh, is, is that or the Chinese, uh, may you live in interesting times, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right. And that's, that's both a blessing and a curse, you know, because, you know, it's a stressful time in, in the world right now. But boy, there's new emerging science and tools that we can use to help us move through our day. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, and it, you know, the thing that, yeah, and we're going to get into this, right. We're going to start talking about the, you know, the, the gut brain axis and things like that. It's a, it's a yet another tool that has roots in ancient medicine, but is now being proved out scientifically. Uh, so, you know, now as, you know, scientists, we can look back at what, you know, what all those old hippies used to do, you know, <laughs> 30 or 40 years ago and go, oh, oh my gosh, they were right about a lot of this stuff, you know, even though they didn't know it, like they knew it, but we couldn't prove it. We couldn't measure it, but now we can. So now it's a, now it's a thing. <laughs> I love that. Well, we're really excited to jump into this, but we love hearing origin stories, you know, 
what got you to where you are today? Would you mind sharing kind of the journey that led you to the path that you're on? Yeah, sure. So, so, you know, the way I refer to myself now, I refer to my, like the, the, my career as, as psycho nutrition, um, or sometimes it's called nutritional psychology that didn't actually exist 20 or 30 years ago, but I've been doing that work all along. It's this idea of, um, and you said it, Casey, a little bit in the in the introduction, right? So my PhD is in nutritional biochemistry. So I know the biochemical impact of food and nutrients and things like that. You know, you eat this food or you consume this nutrient and a stress hormone like cortisol goes up or down or an inflammatory marker goes up or down, right? So that's the biochemistry of it. But now we're able actually to, to link that biochemistry to psychology, to like, you know, that stress hormone and how does that change your resilience or your feeling of stress or how does a neurotransmitter change your mood or your mental focus or something like that. But I started my career as a, as a sport nutritionist. You know, when I got my PhD in nutritional biochem, my job was to work with a lot of, of elite level athletes, right? So I, I I did a lot of work at the Olympic training centers um, and there's Olympic training centers sort of, you know, sprinkled all across the country these days. Um, uh, I did work with the U.S. Track and Field Association, uh, the U.S. Ski Team, the, the, so several sports, several professional sports teams. And it was really, really great, really, really fun, fun early career job. Um, you know, trying to get those athletes to not just perform better physically, but also perform better psychologically, you know, trying to help them get the mental edge and recover better after their workouts and, you know, things like that. But then about a little more than 20 years ago, end of 20, uh, end of 2001, um, my younger brother died of a drug overdose. Um, and it really threw me for a loop for, for, for a period of time, you know, because he was always this kind of person that would like he'd, he'd, he, he would use drugs, illegal drugs to help him cope with depression and anxiety and, and stress levels and things like that. And like, I look back on, on what he went through then, you know, 20 or more years ago and the kind of work that I do now. And I really, really feel that the kinds of things that we do to help people improve their mood and reduce their anxiety and help with their resilience and help with their sleep quality and all that kind of stuff. I think if those tools were available 20 years ago, then it, it, it might have we might have been able to help him naturally in a way that would have helped him feel good enough to not have to go back back to using those drugs, right? So like I think about that kind of thing all the time, but it kind of said when that happened, it kind of set me on the path to say, hey, look at all these cool things we're doing with these elite level athletes. For them to get a mental edge and for them to improve their performance and for them to thrive in the, you know, in the stressful world of elite level competition, what if we could mainstream some of that, right? So the average person could feel better in, in their job or in their family or in their hobbies or like whatever it is that, that, that they want to perform the best at. Why couldn't we use these same tools and that that put me on that path? And it's been it's been a good path, you know, all the way to today. We're like, this is the thing. This is what everybody's talking about now. Everybody's talking about, you know, how can I how can I thrive in this stressful world and how can I get a mental edge and how can I how can I feel good instead of feel blah, you know? And so it's like it's been it's been a you know almost 30 year journey <laughs> to get to where we are today, but but here we are. So let's take advantage of it. Wonderful. Uh, Sean, I want to build a solid foundation for our listeners. Um, so they can build upon this knowledge here. Uh, mental fitness is a term we're hearing more and more. What does it actually mean? Yeah, mental fitness, you know, in my world, mental fitness really can be summed up as resilience, right? That you have the you have the bandwidth and you have the reservoir to to address whatever you encounter in a good way, right? There's all kinds of ways that we can measure that in the laboratory or measure that in the clinic. But it's the, it's the idea that somebody is able to thrive in the face of whatever level of stress that they, that they find themselves in. And so it's, it's, how can I say this? Like most people, if you went up to the average person on the street right now and said, um, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Most people would just automatically default to saying, I'm fine right? I feel, I feel okay. Right. And that really is shorthand these days for I'm stressed out. I'm sleep deprived. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm holding on by my, by my fingernails, right. That I'm, I'm just barely getting by, but because that's the default state for so many people, 
it's just it's 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 almost been normalized, right? You wouldn't go up like you go up to ten people on the street, and zero of them are going to say, "I feel fantastic." Like my mind is clear, and my focus is sharp, and I have I have a good abundant energy all day long. And then you know what? At the end of the day, I'm able to shut it off and get a wonderful night of high quality sleep. Nobody experiences that, and yet that should be the default human condition, and it's not. And so like my idea around mental fitness is, is getting people to that. That should be the normal default situation for every single person. And I think, I think because we're so opposite that, people just don't think that's available to them. And I'm on a mission to let people know that mental fitness is, is the way it should be every day. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so mental fitness, is, is that different than mental wellness? You know, mental fitness is sort of the high end of mental wellness. You know, when we when we describe mental wellness scientifically, there's there's a, there's a couple of ways that we can define it. So one of them is is something called psychological vigor. Vigor in psychology research is the opposite of burnout. So vigor is decided it, it is defined as a as a sustained three tiered mood state characterized by physical energy, mental acuity and emotional well-being all wrapped up into one thing that's vigor so vigor is the opposite of burnout that's how people want to feel that's when you have vigor not only are you are you physically energized and you're you know men mentally sharp but you you're motivated you're resilient you're the kind of person that you know can can get things done and solve problems and form strategies and that kind of stuff right so that's vigor um, sometimes we describe it as human flourishing versus the opposite of flourishing is uh, is languishing. So those are different than depression, which we can measure separately. It's different than anxiety, which we can measure separately. It's, it's so there are all sorts of slices of of mood state and mental fitness. I think is is when people are are starting trying to optimize all of that. A lot of times I describe to people that. That, that there, there's what I refer to as a mental wellness continuum, where at the low end of that continuum, you might actually be depressed and anxious and burned out. The people, and, and then your, your, your solution is to feel normal again, right? Your solution is to sort of get into the middle of that continuum where you might not feel amazing. You might not feel great, but you feel okay, right? You feel, you feel like you can, you, can, you can execute on certain things instead of being in a, in a rut, in a quagmire. But then mental fitness is even another step above that where you're really starting to fire on all cylinders and really starting to, you know, have a have have have, have an advantage over the competition, so to speak. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so exciting to be talking about this. And I love that you brought up the point of how our society has just normalized feeling burnout and almost tend to take pride in just doing the nine to five drive and the grind yeah all the time grind exactly resting. exactly it's almost a badge of honor for certain people right and right. luckily like one of the things i just love is that that is starting to change a little bit uh, yes. you know where it you know it used to be that people would just talk about how many hours they were putting in and how little sleep they got and how hard they were driving and now i think post pandemic i think people are coming out of that a little bit and going that's for the birds. Like I did, that didn't help me at all. That, in fact, that, that caused so many problems in, in my relationships and my, you know, my quality of life. I want something different. And I think there's a lot of people that, you know, probably everybody who's listening to your podcast right now <laughs> is looking for something different. And this is a, this is a way for us to frame that and say, look, this is available to everybody. It's not something that's just like, this pie in the sky thing that's available to some, you know, magical few people who have figured it out. There's some very solid principles that we can recommend to people to bring them closer to mental fitness and, you know, away from burnout and away from languishing. You know, you had mentioned sleep and lack of sleep kind of being the default. How important is quality sleep to our performance overall? Yeah, it is, it is, it is the, it is as important as anything. It's as important as your nutrition, it's as important as your as your meditation practice. It's as important as your exercise regimen. It's it's but sleep is that thing that that comes last for a lot of people, right? You know, there's it, it, you know, even people who are 
very health minded and health conscious and think like, I'm going to really dial in my, my clean eating and I'm really going to, you know, practice my breath work and I'm going to have a gratitude practice and I'm going to do, I'm going to do all the things sleep comes last, even for those people. And they think, you know, well, I'm, I'm probably one of those people who can get by on six hours and you're not, you, <laughs> none of us are right. That's the hate to break it to you, but, but like even the toughest people in the world, right. The army Rangers and Navy seals and like those kinds of people, they, they get broken by sleep deprivation. And it's, it's not a lot. It really is just missing a couple hours. Like if we say to people it's eight hours, right. We use eight hours as sort of the shorthand, like this is the recommendation. Um, if you're, if you're getting six hours, what we call a short sleeper, your metabolism changes, your stress hormones go up, um, your, your neurotransmitter changes, uh, you, you, you get more inflamed. So your whole metabolism changes as a result of that, your whole psychology changes, your immune system changes, your brain doesn't clean itself. So your brain builds up all these toxins that lead you to be at higher risk for Alzheimer's. I mean, I, I you guys get the idea, like, uh, uh, sleep, the importance of sleep cannot be overemphasized. It's really, really important. Oh, thank Not you. to go too far down the rabbit hole, but how much of that do you think maybe is because people feel like sleep is out of their control or they can't do anything to help support that? Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I, I think there's I think and I think there's a lot of things that can interfere with sleep, right? So just the like the stress of the day, if you're having a really stressful day, that's going to make it harder for you to get a good night's sleep and not get a good good night's sleep is going to increase your your fight or flight response, your stress response the next day. So there's a there's a sort of a vicious cycle between our stressful life that most of us are leading right now, you know, modern life and that's interfering with our ability to get a good night's sleep. So that's that's part of it. Um, the other part of it is just not prioritizing sleep. Like so many people just don't think it's as important as it actually is. And so that's, you know, that's education where we can say to people, look, it really is as important as anything else you can think of. But then there are also little like little things that we do to, 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 to sabotage ourselves. And we might not even realize it. You know, a lot of people bring their phone into their bedroom at night, right? And that's a that's a huge no-no. Even if you're using it as an alarm, you should go down to the Walmart and you should spend, you know, eleven dollars on a on an old-fashioned alarm clock uh, that 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 doesn't have a have a computer on it like your phone. Um, some people sit in their beds and watch their phone and doom scroll um, and, until they feel sleepy enough. And what they don't realize is that 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 light is telling their brain to wake up instead of having a darkness cue to tell their brain to 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 go to sleep and calm down. Um, so there's like there's all these little like you know what we call sleep hygiene where we can say, look, let's set up the architecture at the end of your day so that you just get into this default of doing these things every single day, having a wind down routine to really get your sleep quality. And then you'll get to hopefully become a person like me that relishes their sleep and looks forward to their sleep because like I like the sleep. But I know what getting good quality sleep is going to do to my next day. If it's a if it's a workout day, it's my 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 perform my physical performance is going to be better. If it's a if it's a psychological day where I'm writing, like tomorrow is going to be a writing day for me, uh, I'm going to do better writing if I got a good good quality sleep. Um, if we're going to be around other people, if we have a better quality sleep. We're more empathetic. We're more able to pick up on social cues. We're 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 less inclined towards negativity. I mean, it it permeates every single aspect of what it means to be a healthy, functional, you know, high performance human. <laughs> when I think about energy and vitality, I think about a kid. They have the energy to play, run around, climb things. That energy that feels like you just can't contain yourself. It's the stuff we've always wished they could just bottle up and sell to us, right? Well, this company's found a way to do just that. Amari's Happy Juice Pack. Mood, motivation, energy. Things our bodies can naturally produce when both our guts and our brains are happy and communicating. And we can actually improve that process of communication across the axis of the gut and the brain. This is cutting edge science. This is game changing information. This is where science meets soul. This is Amare. And we're helping people feel better naturally. Check out the links in the show notes for discounts and more information. 
You know, we're a term we're starting to hear more and more from emerging science is gut brain access. Could you explain to us what that is? Yeah, this is and this is this is fundamentally changing not just how we think about mental fitness, what we're talking about right now, but fundamentally changing what we think about all of health and medicine, the gut brain axis. So this is the idea that how we feel is not just in our head, it's also in our gut. So our gut, what we call the second brain now, because it is the your gut is the source of the majority of the neurotransmitters in your body. So approximately 90% of our serotonin is made in our gut. And serotonin, a lot of a lot of your listeners will know, is the is the neurotransmitter of happiness. If we don't have enough happiness, uh, I'm sorry, if we don't have enough uh, serotonin, we're likely to be depressed. And if we can get the level of serotonin up higher, we're likely to be le- you know likely to be less depressed or happier. Um, so 90% of it's made in the gut. If we want to be as happy as possible, we need to look at what the gut is doing first before we think even about what's happening up in the brain. Similar for for dopamine, about 70% of dopamine is made in your gut. That helps with motivation. Probably half of our GABA, which is the body's uh, relaxing neurotransmitter, that's made in the gut. The gut also makes a a variety of other signaling molecules, short chain fatty acids and a whole bunch of other things. Um, So if we're not taking care of our gut or our gut is out of balance, our whole gut brain axis is gonna be out of balance. So we're not producing the neurotransmitters in the first place, which means they can't be received by the brain. And so you're producing them in the gut, you're receiving them in the brain, and you're sending them between those two brains across the axis. And your axis is how those signals travel. Some of those signals are gonna travel through your nervous system, which is one part of the axis. Uh, another part of the axis is your immune system. Another is your circulatory system, your endocannabinoid system, et cetera. So we think of the gut-brain axis as a system of communication, and the the, the information that's going across that system are, are, are well-being signals, right? They're neurotransmitters and their appetite hormones and their, you know, if your gut-brain axis is functional, you're going to feel good. And if it's dysfunctional in any way, You might feel fatigued, you might feel sad, you might feel sluggish, you might feel like you can't focus, you know, all all of the things that we think of as mental wellness or mental fitness are are products of the gut-brain axis. So what I'm hearing is this affects all of our neurotransmitters, pretty much our entire system. Uh, Is there anything else that's affecting specifically our mental health in that regard? Yeah, well, I, I I mean lots of things. Like so so if your if your gut brain axis is out of balance, your immune system will be out of balance. And so like here we just we're just you know on the coming out of this global pandemic, there was a really close linkage between your your psychology. You know, where are you depressed, anxious, stressed? How your immune system is functioning, and most people just think of their immune system as a as a shield to protect them from viruses and things like that. Right. But your, a lot of your immune system is governed by what's happening in your gut. So just like your gut is making your neurotransmitters, your gut is actually orchestrating what your immune system is doing. So you know, if your gut is out of balance, you're not going to feel good. If your gut is out of balance, you're not going to be able to protect yourself as well. Um, and so th- like, there's a lot of this linkage between, you know, like I said a few minutes ago, what we're learning about the gut-brain axis is fundamentally changing everything we think about when we think about human health, psychological health, physical health, even, even the aging process itself is thought to reside a lot in what's happening in the gut. And specifically, when we talk about the gut in that way, we're talking about the bacteria in the gut, what we refer to as the microbiome. You know, so like we really have to take care of our bacteria as much as we take care of any other aspect of our of our health. Yeah. So how would addressing the connection here between our microbiome, uh, I guess the heart is in there and the brain help us perform better, you know, whether we're running an ultra marathon or yep. even just facing our everyday stress. Yeah, whether you're whether you're whether you're trying to you know train for an Ironman or you're or or you're you're just trying to get to the end of the day with enough energy to you know be able to spend it on your family and your kids and your pets and your hobbies and things like that, it's all it's all the same stuff. So, um, gosh, where to where to even start? It's it's if you're if you're taking care of your microbiome bacteria and you're taking care of making sure those signals traverse that entire gut brain axis 
it it impacts on every aspect of performance you know and so it, it, i i say to people all the time you don't have to be an elite level athlete to take advantage of this kind of stuff right you might want to just be you like a, a more engaged partner you might want to be better in your with your coworkers you might want to be better and more present with your family and you it, like whatever level of performance that you're trying to achieve like i say this all the time you want to become the best version of yourself and the way to become the best version of yourself is to is to look at this first and like well, one of the things i love about it and, th and this is probably my perspective as a nutritionist is that you can change what's happening in your gut like with a snap of a finger by changing what you eat. So if we're if we're feeding people the standard American diet, we know we're growing a population of bad of of, of bacteria that's going to make more inflammatory compounds and that are going to lead us to feeling more depressed. But if we eat more of a what I call the mental fitness diet, right, which is sort of broadly based on the Mediterranean style diet, we can grow a population of bacteria that's going to make more serotonin so we're happier and make more dopamine so we're more motivated and make more GABA so we can relax in the face of stress and, and have better resilience, right? So you can change all of that based on what you're choosing for your diet. What like what snacks are you putting in your mouth? What supplements are you taking? What you know, and, and that's a, it's a, it's a very easy thing to do. I, I think sometimes people hear us talk about mental fitness and they go, oh gosh, are these guys going to tell me I got to change my whole lifestyle and, you know, I've got to go do, do this and this and move to the top of a mountain or move to a beach or <laughs> something like, I mean, right. So, right. <laughs> but, but as you guys educate, it, it's, it's these little consistent changes that we can make that can really have a big impact. And so for me, it, re it really is the nutrition piece. Oh, you know, I love that. So several thoughts came up while you were explaining that. And the first one is, you know, amen. This isn't about making massive shifts. You know, we talk in, in the intro, I talked about, you know, daily consistent work across the five mountains of, you know, integrated vertical development. Um, don't let that scare you. These, these are really just small daily changes to your life that can have massive impact right and nutrition is one of those right so just how you know breath is another one how how you breathe every day taking some quality time to breathe well um getting a little bit of sunlight a little bit of exercise and then building upon that day after day so thank you and one other thing that came up is um you know you had mentioned where as we're coming out of this global pandemic We've had, um, you know, I think a lot of the, the people who who suffered the most, um, you know, I, what I'm hearing or have heard is a lot of these people had issues that related to perhaps their diet and, and, and that were perhaps preventable, but because we call it the SAD or standard American diet is so prevalent, you know, maybe that information wasn't readily available to them or they just made different choices. So where I'm going with this is, you know, we have it within us and available to us every day to make really good choices. Um, so when we talk about diet and you had mentioned, you know, the mental wellness diet or the um, Mediterranean diet, what does that really mean? What, what does that mean for your everyday person? Yeah, it, it, it means eating fewer processed foods and more whole foods that it's as simple as that, right? It isn't that you have to completely revamp your entire refrigerator and pantry. I hope people will eventually do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 small steps, right? Baby steps. Let's start someplace. And let's start with getting getting some of the processed food out and replacing that with more fruits and vegetables and have a salad, you know, a couple of times a week and try to get more fiber in and more brightly colored fruits and vegetables. And like those are those are small little choices that I, I think sometimes people hear that and they go, Oh, that couldn't possibly make a big, a big impact. But if you if you follow it all the way through this thinking of the of the whole microbiome gut brain axis kind of thing, you you know what you end up doing is you you know you you you're, you're taking away a kind of food that is growing the bad bacteria and sending bad signals. You're you're increasing the intake of a of a good kind of food that's growing the good bacteria and sending good signals. So in a sense, you're turning down the bad signals. And you're turning up the good signals at the same time, and it can really, really have a meaningful effect. And when we see people put into practice, without even without even 
um, encouraging them or motivating them to change their diets, they change their diets because the signals that they're getting across the gut-brain axis are subconsciously changing their behavior. It's it's driving them towards making better food choices. So you make you have to force yourself to make the first food 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 choices, but then they get easier and easier and easier as you make those little consistent changes. And so you know it it it, it you know in in my book mental fitness I've got a mental fitness pyramid diet. I've got a plate uh, graphic where people can see what the food looks like on their plate. And people look at that and I, I think at, at first it might be a little daunting to say like, really half my plate has to be fruits and vegetables? I don't know if I could do that. Well, start with 10% because right now it might be 0% and then pretty soon it can be 20% and then it can be 30% and et cetera, et cetera. But those little, little changes made consistently over time actually add up to, to massive benefits across your gut brain axis and, and, and for your overall performance. So human flourishing, bigger abundance of energy. I mean, these are things you know, most people want. Uh, are there other ways uh, besides our diet and food choices that we can help optimize our GBX or gut brain axis? Yeah, de yeah, definitely. So, so just just being physically active, right? Probably the next the next most impactful one after. So we talked about sleep a little bit. We talked about nutrition just now a little bit. Probably the most next impactful one is going to be is going to be movement. Like m moving your body, it will will actually change your your mental wellness in a in a variety of ways. So every time every single time we contract a muscle, your muscle makes these these signaling molecules that we just broadly call myokines, right? Myo muscle kine is a signaling. Um, those will go to the brain, they'll go to the gut. They will they will help improve the signaling across the gut brain axis. And so again, it doesn't have to be training for an ultra marathon. It's it literally as simple as getting out into the garden taking a walk around the block, taking the dog for a walk, you know, the, like little things like that. The more that you move, the more that you want to move, the more that you're able to move, the more that, the more that, 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 that it like becomes a part of who you are. And I, you know, I, I say this to people all the time. And I think, I think you guys educate around this a little bit that you, you, you want to try to become the kind of person who is an exerciser or who is choosing a healthy diet or who is, thinking about their their breathing or who is getting a good night's sleep, right? The more you can start thinking of yourself as that kind of person, the more that it just becomes what you do instead of something you're forcing yourself to do, right? Instead of saying, I hate exercise, but I'm going to force myself to work out anyway. That's not a long-term proposition, right? Because you're always forcing yourself against your nature. But if you can change your nature to be, hey, I am the kind of person that goes and exercises on a regular basis. It's a little, it's a, it's a subtle psychological trick, but it's a, but it's a very, it's a very important one. Um, so yeah, get out there and move. And then, and then one of you said um, about light exposure, right? If you can do that exercise in the outdoors, that's even better because now you have natural sunlight exposure. You're exposed to the sights and the smells and the air. And, you know, hopefully you can do it in a place that's like more of a natural setting, like a park or a forest or something like that. And then you get the benefit of the plants around you. And, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole body of positive psychology research now called nature therapy, right? Sometimes it's called green therapy when you're exposing yourself to, you know, to forests and to parks or blue therapy when you're exposing yourself to water or yellow therapy when you're exposing yourself to sunlight. So, so get out there and get, get that exposure. That's how humans were designed to, 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 to thrive and flourish is to be out there in nature. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. Um, so right now we're sitting at desks in offices, yep. or in, our homes, <laughs> in, front of computers. in front of computers, <laughs> you know, but our intention, our plan is after this podcast, we're going to get up and go for a 5k walk, right? Nice. It's a beautiful day here in East Tennessee. The sun's out. Couldn't ask for a better um, late winter day. And, um, you know, that's just part of part of our daily rhythm, right? It's just getting out there just for a little bit. Um, it does wonders. But you had mentioned, you know, kind of um, changing our nature, not kind of, you did mention changing our nature. Um, and I, I, this hadn't come up on my initial questions for you. But something that it reminded me of is, um, you know, we can't change our genes. 
but we can perhaps change the expression of our genes. That's right. And and I think that in some some ways connects back to my opening about Chinese and Ayurvedic medicine. It, it, is that true? Yes, that yeah, that is true. And that's something that we we actually didn't know until very, very recently. Um, so, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how come we've never heard about the microbiome and the gut brain axis until just very recently, you know, and by very recently, the last five or 10 years have shown an explosion in, in the research in these areas. And one of the places that, that this research has led is that the microbiome actually determines the expression of our genetic profile. So the genes that we're born with, the 23,000 genes that I have in my body are, 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 are different than the genes that you have in your body, Andy, and the genes that you have in your body, Casey. Um, but the and 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 we can't change those, right? We can at least not now, right? We can talk about genetic engineering and that kind of <laughs> right, stuff right. if we want to, but we can't change our genes. Let's just go with that. But we can change which genes are expressed and which ones are not expressed, meaning which ones are turned on and which ones are turned off. So the way I explain, and 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 a large uh, way that 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 switch gets flipped on or off are by signals that the microbiome sends. The bacteria in your gut sends to the rest of your body. So think of it this way: let's say, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that there was one gene that caused Alzheimer's disease, and I could say, well, is that gene on, and I'm going to get Alzheimer's, or is it off, and I'm going to be protected from Alzheimer's? Your microbiome can determine which genes are turned on and off. And so that's, I mean, that is mind blowing, and that's why every single pharmaceutical company in the world right now has a microbiome division that is trying to figure out how to drug the microbiome to send the right signals to turn on or turn off these, these disease pathway genes, right? And so it's a little more complicated than what I just described because most of these, most of our diseases are, are, are multi-gene, you know, kinds of scenarios, right? It's never just, hardly ever just one gene. Uh, but but if, you could if you could use the microbiome to change a family of genes, right? Let's say we could use the microbiome to turn off several of the inflammatory genes or turn on several of the immune system genes that might protect you, uh, you know, against getting heart disease or it might protect you against you know, developing an infection. You know, it's really, really exciting time. I will say it's early days, right? It's like, we're still trying to figure all that out, but just to understand that it's related and that if we if we move our bodies and we eat the right foods and we have the right you know uh, uh, stress resilience and you know all those kinds of things like these healthy things that we know from traditional medical systems if we can implement those like on a more consistent basis we're taking our genetic profile in a healthier direction it, it it's 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 exciting <laughs> So there's no shortage of supplements on the market. Um, is, is supplementation necessary to to dial in your your gut brain access and work with your microbiome? Yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a big advocate of supplements, right? I I am I I, I say to everybody, I'm a food first nutritionist. Like I really want people to, you know, at, like go 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 for the go for the big things first, right? Get the processed food out of your diet as much as possible. Get in more fiber. Get in more fruits and vegetables. You know that that, that kind of stuff. You don't have to be eating a perfect mental fitness diet or a perfect Mediterranean diet, but like let's let's go and do those kinds of things first. Don't ever think you're going to be able to just pop a pill and not worry about your baseline diet. It doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? But if you have good science based research backed supplements. You can actually use those as the first piece of the puzzle sometimes to, you know, help with your stress levels so that you're not getting stress eating all the time or help with your appetite control. So, so you can make those, you know, make those good choices. You can use supplements to help with your motivation so that you are inclined to go be, be more physically active. You can use supplements to help with your stress levels so you can get a good night's sleep. And, you know, so you can use them to really help you facilitate those good lifestyle choices that we've been talking about but it's um it's a little bit of the wild west out there with supplements right there's a there's probably more not not probably there are definitely more garbage supplements on the market that make claims that don't live up to what the supplement actually does um, there are supplements that are 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 pixie dusted, right? They might have a good ingredient, but it's not it's not enough of an ingredient to actually, you know, deliver a benefit. Um, 
Yeah, so I think it's a I think it's buyer beware, but I think if if customers and consumers want to educate themselves and say and say to the and say to the companies, hey, uh, can you prove to me that this supplement lives up to the claims? Can you tell me why you use this ingredient and not that other ingredient? Can you tell me wh wh where your sourcing comes from? And like the companies that do it the right way, they're going to go out of their way to say, here's our research. Here's why we use this ingredient. Here's why we use this much. Here's why we're using this strain of bacteria versus that strain of bacteria. You know, there's a there's enough companies that are doing it right where I think people can people can find those. And you know, I should I I I should be you know fully fully um you know open open about this. Like I I am an executive at a dietary supplement company, right? And so I formulate products based on those principles that I just said, you know, I'll formulate products and say, I want this strain of bacteria because it's been clinically validated to help with stress levels or mood levels or resilience levels or whatever. And it, and if I can do that, if I can follow the science, then I can go to the customers that are asking those questions that I just said. <laughs> and I can say, listen, there is research to show that this is going to help you feel better. There is research to show this is going to help you perform better. And then, and then you you should be the judge of that, right? You should say, okay, let me see what this research is going to do in my body. How am I going to feel it? How am I going to perform with it? How am I going to respond? Um, and you know, if you follow the science, you can you know you can be reasonably um, you know reasonably uh, 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 proven you know that that you're going to get you're going to get the get, going to get those benefits. You know, um, the other day I was watching TV and I, I think it was on a commercial, probably for a nutrition company. Um, I don't remember the exact facts. I'm going to paraphrase the best I can here, but it kind of struck me is um, this person that was was talking was supposedly a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he said that in medical school, you know, we're taught to, you know, to treat the symptoms and, you know, we do this with pharmaceutical drugs, right? And then those pharmaceutical drugs have could have side effects. And then to mitigate those side effects, we take, you know, you take another, another drug, right? Another drug, right? <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. I'm not anti-medical doctor. I'm, you know, a full disclosure. I'm on a couple of prescriptions right now myself, but you know, it, it well, first of all, I guess, you know, it, and, and just to kind of piggyback on that, a conversation I had with a friend a couple of months ago, um, was, well, he doesn't take any supplements because his medical doctor told him he gets enough nutritional, you know, vitamins and minerals through his diet, mm -hmm. through everything he eats. And I thought there's maybe a, a couple of good points to, to suss out there. Um, you know, the first is natural versus artificial. Mm -hmm. and do we actually get the, the proper nutrition through just our diet? Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's an easy one to answer. The answer is no, uh, nobody does. Uh, not even not even a professional nutritionist like myself, right? I've got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry, for goodness sakes. And like e even even if I ate a quote unquote perfect diet every single day, that food that I'm getting at the grocery store does not have enough of the nutrients in it to get me even to the recommended amounts, right? Which are which are not the optimal amounts, right? That's been that's been proven over and over and over again right if you look at if you look at the very largest national surveys in the united states where where no, nobody is getting the the recommended amounts and certainly not the optimal amounts of all those essential vitamins and minerals right that that that, that data is you can't argue against it it's massive data sets collected over many many years and if 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 people are saying that you are getting everything you need from your from your food they are not up to up to snuff on the on the latest data, right? But that same data set that we have in the United States also exists in Europe, also exists in the UK, also exists in uh, South Africa, also exists in Australia and in many parts of Asia. It's the same thing when we're eating a processed food, modern diet when you know 60 to 70 percent of our calories are coming from processed and ultra processed foods, we're not getting the nutrients that we're getting. And that's only looking at vitamins and minerals. It's not even looking at any of the phytonutrients, the flavonoids and the polyphenols and the carotenoids and the tocotrienols and things like that, that come in seeds and nuts and fruits and vegetables and, and whole grains and all that kind of stuff. So absolutely not, you can't get everything from your food. The next piece becomes, okay, I need a supplement. What do I do? 
well, what most people do is they go to the grocery store and they buy one of those, you know, w- once a day kind of, you know, Flintstone kinds of vitamin. <laughs> I don't want to pick on any particular one, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Right. And they go, okay, now I'm covered. They take one pill and they think they're covered. But what a lot of those really inexpensive products do is they use the 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 cheapest version of vitamins and minerals and th- th- they're not well absorbed. They're not some of them are synthetic, so they're not they're not absorbed and retained in the body very well. So you're doing something, but you're not doing very much to to solve that nutrient gap. Um, you really need to be doing a lot more than that. So yes, I, I think supplements for somebody that wants to live a a high impact, high performance life, you you, you have to supplement if you want to if you want to get the optimal level of nutrients. There's no way around it. You had mentioned um, synthetic. Is is there a time or a, a place for synthetic nutrients? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. So, um, so what would be a good? So, uh, m- most of the time, natural is better, but not all the time. So, vitamin E is a good example. We definitely know that vi- natural vitamin E is superior, probably two to three times better than synthetic vitamin E, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, with B vitamins, it's actually a little bit different. Um, synthetic B vitamins, meaning, and when I say synthetic, the way that we get synthetic B vitamins is we have, instead of extracting them from food, we, we actually have bacteria produce them. And so if we have bacteria produce them in a, in a fermentation process, we can get a very pure a form of a B vitamin that also has better stability. Um, it also has better absorption in the body. So a synthetic B vitamin or a you know nature identical that's made by a bacteria um, a- actually has better stability and better absorption in the body. And so we get a better effect than if we than if we used a than if we used a natural. So like there are some places where you can say like synthetic probably isn't the right word for it. Nature identical is probably a better word for it. But it, 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 you have to really consider that based on every single nutrient. Um, minerals are just rocks, basically. So you know those are coming from somewhere. They're coming from the Earth's crust somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but the way that we can make them better is we could take something like uh, zinc is a good example. Zinc is um, all, all all zinc is the same, right? It's going to be it's going to be extracted from some sort of a some sort of a mineral aggregate somewhere. But then how can you make that poorly absorbed zinc better? You can you can wrap it with an amino acid or you can wrap it with a with a phytosome. You can wrap you can like there's ways you can improve the absorption of that poorly absorbed thing. And that right there, that's kind of a synthetic process, even though you're taking a natural zinc and a natural amino acid, and now you're putting them together in a way that doesn't exist in nature, you're doing it so that you get a better natural effect in the body. So you know, it's 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 a little more complicated than just to say natural is better or synthetic is better. You know, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of gray area there. Awesome, thanks for explaining that because that's one of those areas where I've come across in the past of like synthetic. What? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that really. Um, I want to keep ticking off a, a couple other points though. As we again, you know, moving out of the COVID, one of the things that we were told to to do or use during COVID was zinc, right? You just mentioned that. Um, so what we noticed was, you know, people posting their, their Instagrams and, and, and Facebooks with their big bottle of, you know, a hundred milligrams of zinc and taking yeah. it three times, you know, over just kind of popping. Is that actually healthy? No, it can be, it can actually be detrimental to your immune system, right? So z- zinc is definitely, zinc is an essential nutrient. Um, the, the optimal level of it for most people is going to be around 15 milligrams a day. So if you if you feel like you're getting a little bit sick and you might say like oh maybe I need a little bit more zinc like if you went up to 30 like doubled it that might be okay for a couple of days but if you tripled it and you went up to 45 you take 45 milligrams of zinc for for a week or two and you're going to get into a zinc toxicity situation right so zinc is is and I'm glad actually glad that you asked about zinc because that's one where there's a very narrow safety window where a li- like too little is bad just the right amount is good, like you know what we call the Goldilocks syndrome. But then you can very quickly get into too much. Um, vitamin D is another one that people were taking a lot of during the pandemic, and it is one that I recommend that people take for their immune system and for their mood and for a variety of different things. 
but that one has a much wider safety window. So you can supplement with a lot of vitamin D before it becomes a problem. Vitamin C is one you can supplement with a lot of before it becomes a problem. You'll, you know, you'll probably, your gastrointestinal tract will tell you you're taking too much of it before, before it gets to be a dangerous <laughs> level. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a problem that a lot of people get into. They think like, oh, well, if a little bit of this thing is good, then a lot of it's going to be even better. And sometimes a lot of it can actually be worse for the, for the thing that you're trying to solve. So, you know, I, that's one of the reasons I tell people like, look for research back supplements, but then also follow the label directions and don't, you know, don't go, you know, exceeding them just because you think more is better. Um, so I had this situation in the last uh, couple of months here with um, one of my medical providers where they had been prescribing high quality, high purity fish oil. Mm -hmm. But now the National Institute of Health, I believe it is, came out with a new study in the last six months, maybe even up to a year ago, I can't remember the exact time frame, and no longer supports the omega-3s as being heart healthy or having any significant impact on your heart. And so therefore they're not going to prescribe them to me anymore. And then I so I went and I read the 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 abstract and it, it clearly called out the benefits were still around brain health and inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, well, well, what about this? What about nope, nope, sorry, we're not doing it. Do you have any thoughts around that? Or are you aware of that study? Yeah, it, it, it really depends on how, how the studies are designed, right? And this, this might get into the weeds a little bit for your listeners, but um, there, there are similar studies that, that people will point to sometimes. They'll say, well, wait a minute. I, 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 uh, I, uh, these medical studies came out and showed that multivitamins don't work, right? Or fish oil supplements don't work. The question to ask is work for what? Right, so the multi, the sort of anti-multivitamin studies are showing that if you take a multivitamin, um, it's not going to prevent cancer. It's not going to prevent heart attacks. This is what this is what this this omega study showed that it doesn't seem like it's going to prevent you from getting a heart attack. But what it is going to help you do is have better blood flow. It's going to help with your brain. It's going to lower your inflammation, which is related to a bunch of other conditions, but it might not prevent you from getting a heart attack. And why is that? Well, it's because there's all kinds of other things that can cause a heart attack. There are arrhythmia issues. There are cholesterol issues. There's a, there's a variety of different things. So it's, it's almost like throwing the baby out with the bathwater where you're saying like, well, it doesn't prevent this one thing, even though it does these 10 other beneficial things. We're gonna not we're gonna not uh, allow a, a prescription because it doesn't do this one thing, but that's the wrong question, right? And I think sometimes, sometimes those studies, and I, I'm also not an anti pharmaceutical person at all, but I think sometimes those studies are designed to make a point uh, that these are not pharmaceuticals. Um, and that they shouldn't be treated as pharmaceuticals, right? They're, you know, they're really here to improve the function of the body, sometimes improve our mental wellness, sometimes improve our physical performance. They're not there to treat a disease or prevent a disease from happening. Um, so anyway, yeah, we could we could go down this rabbit hole as, as, as much or as little as you want to, but I think I think that's the bottom line for most people. Yeah, that, I think that's a high level, uh, very, very important information. Um, two other things we talked about the standard American diet and something that went on or goes on with, with Americans, maybe just humanity right now in general is we caffeinate and then we downregulate with alcohol. That's right. Um, and it, this is, I think it, it is so pervasive that I wanted to touch on, on, on these two points here. Um, so how much caffeine is, is too much or just the right amount? And then what effects do al does alcohol have on our performance? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, 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 these are two substances that we use a lot of, right. I, I mean, yeah. And you, you just described it perfectly, right. We're, we're caffeinating all day long. And then in order to relax, we're, 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 we're using the depression at, you know, alcohol through the pandemic too. alcohol usage went through the roof. And so did, so did liver problems, right? Non-alcoholic fatty liver, cirrhosis, you know, all sorts of things. I have, I have some friends who um, are, are, are liver physicians and they, they just talk about how like they're seeing so many problems of people just like basically drinking themselves into their grave. And I'm someone who like, I, I enjoy my coffee and I enjoy a glass of red wine from time to time. And, you know, so I'm not, I'm not anti any of that. 
but I think these are great examples of the benefit is in the moderation. So when we look at caffeine, we definitely know that if you go above 400 milligrams of caffeine in a, in a, in a given day, daytime period, that's going to set off a fight or flight response. Like it, it, that, that overstimulation is going to get you to make more adrenaline, epinephrine, make more cortisol, and that's going to be detrimental in the long run because you're overexposed to these stress hormones. And so the solution there would be if you are going to use caffeine, definitely make sure, excuse me, make sure that you're below 400 milligrams and maybe try to keep it around 200 milligrams, right? As a, as a, and that's going to be a cup or two of coffee. Um, we do know that there are benefits at that level, right? So then somebody would say, well, how about zero caffeine? How about zero coffee? And, uh, one of my one of my jokes that I have with people every New Year's is that people will say, "All right, I'm trying to get off a of coffee for my New Year's resolution. Can you give me some recommendations?" And I go, "Yeah, my recommendation is get a get a different resolution because coffee <laughs> actually can be healthy for you, beneficial for you. Coffee, tea, like those lightly caffeinated beverages, you have one or two of those, black, right, or just a little bit of sweetener in it, not a not a frappuccino milkshake kind of thing." But if you have a little bit of that, you're you're getting the polyphenols that are in the coffee or the tea. You're getting a little bit of the caffeine, which is going to actually help to stimulate neurons, which is going to be it actually going to be going to be uh, going to be anti-diabetic. It's going to be anti-Alzheimer's. It's going to have some really good health benefits at those low levels, but detrimental levels or uh, uh, detrimental effects at the high levels. It's it's the, it's the Goldilocks principle again, right? Mm -hmm. Not too little, not too much, just right. And the just right really seems to be like a cup or two. So if, if you like to do that, enjoy it and, and get the health benefits. Seems to be the same thing with alcohol. Um, with alcohol, the, 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 the data is shifting a little bit just, just in the last two years or so, where we used to say to people, well, a couple of drinks a day actually might be better for your brain and better for your heart than zero. And there were really good studies to show that. But now there are also some really good studies to show that there's a subpopulation of people that is so so for so for women now we say no more than one drink. And for men, we say probably one drink is where you need to be, but absolutely no more than two drinks. And so that's gonna be, you know, six ounces of wine, um, you know, eight to twelve ounces of beer or something like that. Um, I don't know if I agree with the with the one or two ounces of hard hard alcohol or not, because at least with the beer and wine, you can point to some of the other things. You can point to the hops. You can point to the polyphenols. You can point to that kind of stuff. But above that, you're starting to see problems for 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 neuron damage. You're seeing problems for gut damage, gut lining damage. So again, it's sort of the the dose is the poison sort of thing, right? Where we can get benefits at those low levels. But de but absolutely detrimental effects at the high levels. So you touched on this earlier, and I want to come back to it. Is you know where where what people should look for, what questions they should ask when considering supplements to upgrade their gut biome, or just supplements in general. Um, how big of an impact does sourcing play in, into supplements? Huge, I, I, absolutely huge. We're, we're like so. I, so I, here's how I ask people to to evaluate supplements, right? Whether they're supplements that I've formulated or they're supplements that somebody else has formulated, and they're out there on the market. You want to ask, where's the research, right? When where's the research? First of all, the best research is going to be on that finished product. Have you ever has you you the company? Have you ever done any research on this bottle? This finished product that I'm going to buy and ingest in my in my in my system, and so, some sometimes they have that, sometimes not. Um, and so if they if they dance around, if they you know try to change the subject and things like that, go, go ask somebody else because the companies that are doing the research are going to want to tell you, yes, here's our research, here are our patents, here are our clinical studies that have been published, and you can go and read them yourself if you want to. The next level is. Are they using research uh, validated uh, ingredients, right? Are they using the ashwagandha, for example, that has been used in this study and this study and this study? Or are they just using a generic one? Um, uh, the next level would be, all right, you don't have any research on your product. You don't have any research on your ingredients. Are they at least clean? Are they at least being sourced from places where you're, you, you don't have heavy metal contamination or 
pesticide contamination or that sort of thing? Uh, and, and can you please show that to me? Can you show me that you test for pesticides and that you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, quality control and things like that? So like, those are the three levels. And if you can't at least get satisfactory answers at some of those levels, you absolutely should not be choosing that supplement because that's one of the examples of you know all the dirty gross stuff that 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 really gives the supplement industry a bad name where companies just go how can we do it cheap how can we tell a nice story around it and how can we sell it to somebody and, and may, maybe never see that customer again the 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 ethical companies are going to want to sell it to you one time and they're going to want to have you get a good experience so you buy it again and you buy it again because you feel something and you buy it again because you can see a difference and you buy it again and 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 you can't get that kind of an experience and th that kind of relationship unless you follow the science unless you follow the sourcing unless you follow the quality so yeah there are companies out there that do it right i like to think that i do it right with the companies that i formulate for uh, but it's not it's not standard practice unfortunately Thanks for clarifying that. That's, I think, very important information. Um, so two terms that, that came up that I think you touched on to some extent, you know, scientifically validated. Um, what does that, what does that mean? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, that's a $64,000 question right there. It can mean everything from, you know, we, we, we studied it in a group of people like you, and we found these benefits that are meaningful to you. You know, like you know, it could be a it could be a mental wellness benefit. It could be a sports performance benefit. It could be a it could be a health parameter benefit. Um, it could be that we that we uh, th that it's been studied in animal models, right? And in mice, it helps the mice live longer. And maybe that's close enough. And you want to take a chance on it, right? There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of supplements in the in the anti aging category that are like that. You know, the you know resveratrols and NADs and NMNs and it gets to be a whole alphabet soup of all these different kinds of things that certainly they make mice live longer and they make worms live longer but is that enough information for you to see if it's going to make you live longer right that th like that study could never be done in humans because you'd have to run an 80 year long study and no one's going to do that right so mm -hmm. there's some of that like mm, the research the scientific validation is good enough for me to take a chance on it or not. Um, and then there's a lot of things that have just, just never, never been studied. And you have to say like, well, has it been used in a, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, for example, like, oh, they used it for 3000 years and there must've been something to it. And <laughs> I, I, I'm going to use it for, you know, general health tonic. Right. So those are all different levels, so to speak of, of scientific validation. And people have to have to sort of determine like, where's their, where's their comfort point, I guess. Yeah, you know, from it, I hesitate to, to use this moniker, but I, I think to some degree, you know, we're we're kind of biohackers. So yeah, you know, sometimes we're we're willing to take a, a chance on something that maybe doesn't have the the you know blind or double you know the placebo you know um, uh, peer reviewed that type yep. of thing. But you know, overall, I, I think that there's a lot of great information out there. And if you take the time just to look at it, instead of going with the slick marketing, uh, because I think a lot of supplement companies are really great at really slick. Right. Exactly. To, get yep. you, to pull you in and, and, you know, and there's maybe not a lot to, to the substance of, of the product itself. Yeah. Yeah. I said, somebody shared a video with me the other day of a, uh, a company that just launched a, a a new a new gut health product, right? So beautiful video that they sent me. I was like, wow, this looks amazing, right? And they told a good story about how it works and the ingredients and the sourcing and all that kind of stuff. And then I went and I looked at their supplement facts panel and I was able to go, wait a minute, here's their bacteria. Not a single one of them tells me what strain it, it is. And if I don't know the strain, you actually don't know what it's going to do. Look at these herbs that are supposed to support gut health. Not a single one of them is a validated, scientifically proven herb. Like none of them have studies on them. None of them were standardized to any bioactive ingredients. And so I'm like, wow, you know, if if I had if I were a typical consumer and just looked at that really slick video, I might just go, yeah, of course, click and buy. Let's let's try some of that. And I probably would have wasted my fifty or sixty dollars. Because the the what's in the bottle doesn't really match up to what was in the marketing, right? So you have to be able to go like what I should have done if I really wanted to buy the product is 
email the customer service and say, can you show me the research? And can like, where does this ingredient come from? And I noticed on your label that, you, that you're not listing the strains. And can you tell me what strains? And the answers back probably would have given me all the information that I needed to say like, maybe this isn't matching up to what they're, what they're saying about it. So you are the chief science officer uh, for Amari Global, mm -hmm. uh, which is also known as uh, the mental wellness company. Right, right. And yeah, that's our tagline, the mental wellness yes, company. I love that. And I, it's, we're not hiding the fact that we love this company. We are big proponents of it. And it has literally made huge changes in my life uh, from reduced migraines to reducing medications I was on and just overall feelings of well-being, joy, and happiness. Uh, I, I could go on and on, but, but what makes this company different from the other nutritional companies that are out there? Yeah, well, it, I, I, I think it's some of the things that we've just talked about. We are one of the few companies, not the only company, right? But one of the very few companies that really does follow the science, right? When we say we're going to develop products that help with mental wellness and we're going to name our company the mental wellness company, we need to make sure that those products truly deliver. And the way to make them deliver is to follow the science. So, you know, the, the example that I just gave that other company that had great marketing, but not, not great formulas they could have made their product better by choosing the actual strains of bacteria that have already been shown to help with depression and help with anxiety and help with stress that like those are that that's what we did right we said let's go why don't we just get those those have already been validated let's get those and put them in our products okay good that's a that's a great place to start now let's look at some of the herbs that are used instead of going out there and getting a generic ashwagandha let's go out there and get the ashwagandha that was actually used in this clinical trial to show that it helps with tension and anxiety and brain fog and those sorts of things, right? So now let's go and get the prebiotic fibers that have actually been used in the studies to show that they help improve resilience and they help with leaky gut and they help with whatever, 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 right? So it's it, it, it's not hard necessarily, right? The research is there. It's available to scientists that are doing these formulations to go and choose the right ingredients. But the, but the problem with it is that they're expensive, right? Right. For for the ingredient companies that are doing the research, they there's an investment there, right? They have to pay money to get that research done and get it published and have good quality control and source it from the right field in India or Africa or South America, wherever this stuff is coming from. That that there's a cost associated with all of that, and I think a lot of companies, finished product companies, look at that and they go, "Hmm, you know, <laughs> I could get I could get ashwagandha." Not the same ashwagandha, but I could get some and I could still put it on my label. And it might not be the same stuff, but good enough, you know, and good enough is not good enough, right? Good enough is is cutting corners, right? Good enough is getting something that isn't standardized or isn't used in the clinicals or isn't doesn't have the same quality control. Uh, and so you might get, you might go, oh, good enough. And it just has a little bit of pesticide residue in there, right? Customers don't want that, right? People who really care about their health want the good stuff. And I think I think they're prepared to say, you know what? I'm going to pay an extra $5 at, so I can feel good about where it comes from and the fact that it's going to work in my body and I'm not going to get side effects from it. And it's not going to give me a rash or you know whatever the case may be. <laughs> but like, th there's there's people who do it the right way and people who don't. You had mentioned... Um... Uh, pesticides, and this is a whole another rabbit hole we we won't go down today. But um, neurotoxicity and pesticides is just like wow, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You tell, you tell a great story um, that we've heard um, about ethical sourcing and and where you're sourcing some of your ingredients. And and one of them was that struck me was around um, you know was a palm fruit extract or palm fruit. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering that correctly? where there's a certain area of, of the world where it's it's very detrimental to um, the planet. And then there's another part of the, the, the world where you guys source it from. I'll just let you tell the story if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so palm fruit is a good example of that. So, so we're one of the very few companies in the world that uses um, a, a, a water-soluble palm fruit extract. And, and the reason we use it is because it can help the heart to be more efficient at doing its job as, as a pump. But because of that improvement in efficiency, 
the electrical act activity of the heart changes and the electrical activity of the brain changes. So what we call the heart brain axis can really be improved with palm fruit extract. So you get a physical performance benefit, you get a mental performance benefit out of this one nutrient. It also increases dopamine. It also increases compounds, uh, uh, neurotrophic factors called BDNF that help to protect neurons and grow new neurons. So it does a lot of really good stuff. So we were really excited to use this but where most palm fruit comes from in the world is from places like Malaysia and Philippines and Indonesia and places where what, 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 what they do is they go into the rainforest and they clear cut the rainforest and they and they put up palm palm trees, right, to grow these palm fruits. And the reason they do that is because palm fruit is used to generate palm oil, which is used in processed foods around the world. So processed food industry is a big business. There's a, they need a lot of palm palm oil. And so they need a lot of palm plantations, but we don't want to be part of clear cutting rainforests and decimating the the habitat of the orangutans and you know and there's a lot of pesticides that get used and that's bad for the groundwater and that's bad for the local people that live there and like it's just bad in every in every way. You can go into those parts of the world and you can source palm in a in a in a responsible way, right? You can you can buy it from small farmers. You can make sure that. Uh, that they don't use pesticides. You can make sure that they're planting on land that was not previously rainforest. Like there's ways that you can do it, but you have to jump through a lot of hoops to do it. Um, we decided to, let, let, let's not even open that Pandora's box. Why don't we just go to another part of the world? And we we found a group in Mexico that was interested in putting palm trees on cattle land. So not rainforest land, cattle land that is already a low biodiversity area. Now they're making it more biodiverse by putting palm trees in there and putting in wildlife corridors and all that kind of stuff. So we worked with them directly to do research around it with MIT, where I where I studied entrepreneurship. So scientists at MIT studied this material, found all the all the wonderful things it can do in the body. We worked with the plantation to make sure that no pesticides, um, that 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 the workers are being treated in in terms of like fair trade practices and like all that kind of stuff. So there's like there's a quality reason, there's a research reason, there's a there's a there's a uh, like a climate biodiversity good for the planet, good for the animals reason. Uh, there's a good for the people reason. Um, you know, so all of that I think is is important before you even think about what's in the bottle and what is it going to do in my body, right? And I think I, I'm really glad you asked that question because the, especially the younger generation, so like my kids and their friends ask those kinds of questions, right? They, they're like, oh, interesting. That product can help with my physical performance and my mental performance. Where do the ingredients come from? And how are they grown? And who's growing them? And are you paying a fair wage? And like, those are things when I was their age, it wasn't even on my radar, but but now is on the collective radar. And so, you know, at Amari, we're making sure that we're that we're answering all those questions. Love um, that world centered, heart centered view. Right, right. Because it's 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 and this is gonna sound weird coming from a scientist, right? Because I'm more of a like a data driven guy, but like that's all karma, right? It's all good for you know, you put that goodness out into the world, you hopefully get goodness coming back at you. You know, and so that's, you know, if, if we're going to be the mental wellness company, we got to we got to practice what we preach. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think for for us, that was one of the uh, appealing aspects of this of, of, of Mari as well. So thank you for sharing that. So we were going to ask the question of, you know, if someone wanted to start feeling better today, where would you have them start? But I, I think I want to go a little bit further with that is where I mean, we've talked about all the different the diet, the exercise, the sunlight. Um, where would you have them start with supplementation? I mean, what what would you recommend? What do you use? Yeah, so so the the the, the thing that I recommend from from the Amari portfolio is is something called Happy Juice, um, and the reason I recommend that is because it's really easy for people to do. It tastes good. Um, and it addresses a lot of what we've just talked about, right? So when we talk about the gut-brain axis as a system, there's things we can do in the brain to help us feel better without even thinking about the gut. There's things that we can do separately in the gut 
to help us feel better without even thinking about the brain. And 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 likewise, the axis, we can just address, like we can just make the the efficiency of the axis in carrying those signals between the two brains better. And just because we do that, people feel better. So what happy juice is, is it's a coordinated approach to saying, let's do some things in the gut. Let's do some things in the brain. Let's do some things in the axis. And as a result of that, you'll feel holistically better. So I, I refer to it as coordinated neurotransmitter balance, where we can help somebody feel better by increasing their dopamine levels. They'll feel more motivated. But we can also help them feel better by increasing their serotonin levels. They'll be happier. And if you were to ask people to choose between those, would you rather have better serotonin signaling and be happier or better dopamine signal? Uh, signaling and be more motivated, which would you choose? Most people would look at you funny and go, what, why, why, I, I can't make that choice. Like I want both, please. You know? And so that, that's what happy juice is all about. And that's why we call it happy juice to make it kind of, you know, fun and approachable and things like that. But it's lowering stress hormones like cortisol. It's raising GABA. It's raising serotonin and dopamine. It's like, it's, it's helping the entire system work better and as a result of that, people take it. And literally the first day they take it, they come back and they go, yeah, I'm feeling better. I feel a little less tense today, right? That's great because then they're going to take it tomorrow and then the next day and the next day. And after a little while, their brain fog lifts and they can focus better. And after a little while, their resilience comes back. And not only are they low stress, but now they can handle more stress and they can solve problems better in a stressful situation. And then their mood is better and then their anxiety is lower and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that, that is what I mean when I talk about mental fitness, it's about getting people to feel better in all those different ways, instead of just some of those different ways. Nice. And I'm so excited to have options now that don't require, well, first a prescription. Right. Um, I, I used to be, one of the believers, you know, I, I need a prescription to fix this or to do this or that. And the difference of the feelings of taking something natural like this and the pharmaceutical are just, it's so much cleaner and well, it feels more natural and sustainable, right. I think in my own body. So right. it's so exciting to have these options. Right. And cleaner, cleaner, I think is a fair way to describe it, right? Instead of taking a synthetic chemical to force your body to do something, you're taking these natural compounds that are allowing your body to do something. And that's a, that's a subtle, but a very, very important difference, right? If you can get your body to make more of what it needs to make it in the situations that you need them in the right amounts, that's just getting your body back in better balance. Like I, you know, one of the ways that I describe the microbiome to people sometimes is that it is this wonderful, amazing internal natural pharmacy that all of us have inside of us. And so sometimes it can be out of balance, but if we can get it back in balance, now you have this internal natural pharmacy that makes what we need when we need it in the right amounts. And that lets us navigate through this stressful world that we're, that we're all trying to navigate through as best we can. Beautiful. Um, so I, I kind of want to go in one other direction, if you'll allow. Um, and that is, what do you use from Amari or for supplementation when you're training and, and actually doing Ironmans? Yeah, I, 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 I use a lot of stuff. Um, so my, my morning routine is the same every single morning. So I take, I take the happy juice that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and I take it along with two other products. We have a product called Menta Heart that has that palm fruit extract that we just talked about. So helping my heart brain axis work better. That helps me. Um, it's not really a pre-workout kind of a thing. I do take it before my workouts, but it helps with, it helps with heart function, helps with brain function. But it's more of like a like a stamina kind of an effect where you'll notice it not at the first part of your workout to get you motivated. You'll notice it at the end part of your workout to keep you going, right? So that's the that's the kind of effect that you get. I also use a product that we have every single day called Mood Plus, which is um, a few years ago when we launched it, it was a finalist for Botanical of the Year because it has it has all of the best mood support supplements in it. So um, it has it has one ingredient called Kana that helps with resilience. Uh, it has another one called Rafuma that helps with, with overall mood. Um, it has a really good ashwagandha that helps with anxiety and, and um, tension. 
um, and it has a it has a magnolia bark uh, that helps with with stress eating and and you know that 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 kind of stuff. So stress, uh, depression, anxiety, and resilience all in one product from an herbal perspective. And that's the one that like I really can't go without that. I travel with it. I have bottles of it all around because it really is something that you can you can really it really takes the edge off and gives you like if you're somebody with a temper or somebody with a with a with a low you know, with a low capacity for dealing with BS, um, this, this, this allows you to roll with the punches a little bit better. Right. So that's, that's one that I, that I use a lot. Um, and then I use some of the standard things. Like I know I need a good multivitamin. So I use our multivitamin called Vita GBX. I know I need a good fish oil. So I use Omega. Um, I, I, I have, we have a digestive product that has honest to God taken away my heartburn. I used to have really, really bad heartburn. Haven't had it probably in five years significantly since since I started using that product. Um, so there's a lot of things that are like, like and 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 none of those are really performance products, right? I'm not taking any of those pills and saying or or powders and saying this is helping me run faster or run further, right? It's the idea of allowing yourself to do what you need to do so you're more resilient, you can handle more stress, so you don't get sick and hurt. You get better quality sleep, and that's another one I take. I we have a we have a really nice sleep product that helps your body um, go through sleep cycles more efficiently. So you spend more time in REM sleep and more time in deep sleep, so your body and mind recover. But if I can recover better because I'm sleeping better, that means I can exercise harder the next day without developing a problem, right? So it's all about if you get this whole system to work better, you're going to be better in whatever it is that you're trying to do. We've covered a lot of ground here in in just over an hour, hour and a half. Um, is there anything that we've missed? No, I think we have covered a lot of ground. I think it's I, I I really appreciate the opportunity to bring this out to your listeners. I think I think once people hear, I think the first time people hear this microbiome and gut brain axis, and it can improve your mental wellness, it can improve your physical performance, and it can you know delay your aging, and it it it, it sounds too good to be true. Um, and it should sound too good, too good to be true until you actually go and do the research for yourself and go and, and look up microbiome and aging and microbiome and mental wellness and gut brain access and performance. And you'll go, oh my gosh, this is something I've never heard of before. But now there are thousands and thousands of studies that are validating this natural approach. And then you go, oh, okay, well, who's doing that, right? And then you find Amari. And then you ask the kinds of questions that we talked about. Where's your research? And you know why are you sourcing? And how are you sourcing? And what are you testing for? And all that kind of stuff. And then you go, okay, there seems to be some research out there. These guys seem like they're doing it the right way. And like I, like I said earlier, you, you say to yourself, I'll be the judge of that. I'm going to try one of these products and I'm going to see what it does in my own body. And then, and then you make the determination. Is this the right regimen for me? Are these products doing something that's that's not just noticeable but meaningful in my life? And I think once people improve their mental well-being and they start going in that right direction, I think they will look back and they go, I don't ever want to go back there. I don't want to ever go back to feeling burned out or languishing or any of the words that we use for it. I don't want to ever go back to feeling blah <laughs> because I feel amazing now. Right. And I want to keep feeling amazing. And, and, you know, there's lots of ways that we can then start plugging in other stuff like light exposure and gratitude and movement and everything else end up becoming easier once we once we feel a little bit better. Right. It's a get you out of that vicious cycle of badness into a virtuous cycle of getting better and better and better and climbing <laughs> all those five mountains. Right. Yes. I love it. Well, we are so grateful for you taking the time to chat with us today, Sean. Um, where can our listeners go to find out more about your work? Be best place is probably just go to my blog, which is just my name, seantalbot.com. Um, I post, you know, summaries of research up there. I tell people where I'm speaking and where I'm doing my certification programs. Um, I've got a YouTube channel also um, if people want to see the videos. But a lot of times I link out from those from my blog. So, yeah, go to the blog, seantalbot.com is the easiest place. Awesome. We'll have links in our show notes and... Um... Once again, thank you, sir. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Take care.